You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Welcome back to Win the Day. The quote for this episode comes from Oscar Wilde and says, Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. And boy, we've got a special treat for you today. We're sitting down with one of the world's leading entrepreneurs and all-round legends, Mike Michalowicz. If you need help with your career or you're thinking of going down the entrepreneurial route, this is the episode for you. By his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two multi-million dollar companies. Confident that he had the formula to success, he became an angel investor for small business, but then proceeded to lose his entire fortune. Then he started all over again, driven to find better ways to grow healthy, strong companies. Mike has devoted his entire life to the research and delivery of innovative, impactful strategies to help business owners succeed. He is the creator of Profit First, which is used by hundreds of thousands of companies across the globe to drive profit. He's the creator of Clockwork, a powerful method to make any business run automatically. And his latest, arguably most impactful discovery is Fix This Next where he details the strategy businesses can use to determine what to do and in what order to ensure healthy, fast, permanent growth and avoid those debilitating distractions. Mike is a former columnist for the Wall Street Journal, a business makeover specialist on NBC and author of number one best-selling books like Clockwork, Profit First, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur and his new book, Fix This Next. You're going to love this one. Let's win the day with Mike McCallowitz. Well, Mike McCallowitz, so great to see you. Thanks for being on the Win the Day show. James, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, first of all, I want to start by letting you know that your audio book for The Pumpkin Plan from an energy perspective is absolutely, <laughs> the content of course is amazing, but I mean, I have never heard an audio book that's as enjoyable to listen to as I have with The Pumpkin Plan. So well done, sir. And it must be comforting to know that if, if all else fails, you at least have a, a profitable career as a narrator ahead of you. you may, perhaps, right? Yeah, I, I get pretty jacked up. It's funny when I go to the recording studio, this is actually a true story. I go to the recording studio, I always stand. Like I, I'm the only person that stands. And so when I arrive at these studios, they're like, um, here's your seat and stuff. And uh, I'm like, no, you gotta redo the whole thing. I'm sorry, because I, I get so jacked up. Well, I went to this one studio and uh, the, the narrator before me for his book was a guy named Michael J. Fox. You, you may recognize that name. And I remember coming in, he had just left. And I talked with the producer. I said, what's it like having... Uh, Michael J. Fox present. And she goes, he's a thoroughbred. Like he wants to be whipped and he'll run faster. And I'd read for a while. I said, what do you think I am? She's like, you're kind of a Clydesdale. You kind of clump along <laughs> and you get the job done, but we have to do a lot of retakes. So that's my reading skill. Yeah. Well, it's great. I feel like you can get a lot more energy standing up. I mean, I'm exclusively from a standing desk and it sounds like it works for you too. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, you work with entrepreneurs, but it seems that there's so much overlap for professionals, for relationships, and so many other different areas. Through your work, have you found some unexpected results outside of that entrepreneurial audience who you primarily serve? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I have. Um, it's married couples. Like, I am not a couples counselor by any stretch of the imagination. I have had multiple occasions where couples who are also business partners have reached out and said, we've reconciled our marriage, we, we feel stronger. And uh, it's interesting how our personal lives and our business lives are locked. And when it's our marital life and our partner life, it can get to be a real nightmare. I think, I think what it's been is that the systems I teach simplify the process, but it simplifies the communication. I think the partner starts speaking eye to eye and, and they're not cross talking. And per perhaps that serves marriages. I never expected that, but I do hear that frequently. Yeah, I think things like even planting the right seeds, it's making sure like, what are we doing each day to make sure we're focused on that end goal of whether it is a successful marriage or a successful business partnership. Anyone who goes into business who who are already in a remote romantic relationship, I mean, there's maybe two or three times I've seen that actually work successfully. Everyone else just ends up burnt out. And of course, the relationship is is one of the big sacrifices. 
listen, I can barely be with myself 24 hours a day. That's actually really hard. Being with someone else 24 hours a day, forget it. <laughs> well, in, in your books, you challenge the modern day definition of entrepreneurship and state that real entrepreneurs shouldn't be doing most of the work. Instead, it's their job to identify the problems, discover the opportunities, right. and then build the processes that allows other people and other things to do the work for them. But how do these entrepreneurs recognize that they are on that hamster wheel and what can they do about it? Well, yeah, if you start seeing yourself doing repetitive tasks, that's the number one indicator. So if you do something again and again and again, that's an indication that there's, first of all, demand for that task to be replicated, but you, the entrepreneur, need to find a way to outsource it, systematize it, assign it out. Because if you're doing the repetition, that means you are now within the business. You know, an entrepreneur, at least in the early stages, we are that icebreaker. We're going to break into the new space and, and leave space behind for other people to do the work. But if we keep on turning around, we can't break forward. Ultimately, too, we need to transition from doing any kind of work, including the ice breaking, and moving our way to designing outcomes. And what I mean by this is clear vision and then considering almost like a chessboard, putting the right people in the right places, the right systems, the right places to choreograph them collectively to achieve that outcome. That's what the ultimate definition of entrepreneurship. We are not doing the job, we are creating the jobs. Yeah, and people fall into those bad habits over time where it's probably hard for them to, what, what's the old expression that says people are too busy working in the business rather than taking a step back and working on the business? That's right. So what, what separates the top entrepreneurs and professionals, the ones who are always onto bigger and better things and always seem to be making a bigger impact and feel and will certainly appear that they're free versus your run of the mill entrepreneur and professional who's constantly on the brink, on the brink of burnout and never seems free? You know, I, I find it seems to be, and this is no hidden secret, but it, it seems to be purpose, purpose in the business, that there's a greater purpose of why we're doing what we're doing. I believe the entrepreneurs of struggle are going after money. Um, you know, this is a way to make an income and support my life. Well, that's a very volatile thing. If this doesn't make enough money, we move on to something else. We get frustrated. But entrepreneurs that lean into purpose, meaning this is why I'm on this planet and my business is an amplification or expression of serving that reason, those people become relentless. I'm not saying relentless in that they're working ridiculous hours necessarily. They may, it's not healthy in my opinion, but they have a ridiculous commitment to achieving that purpose. They become very thoughtful about it. They, they look on ways of amplifying it. They look at ways to leverage. That's, I think, the drive of purpose. Purpose also... You don't give up. And, and a lot of these successes, and you know this, overnight successes take 10 or 20 years. A lot of these successes, when they come to our purview, when we see it as a consumer, well, they've already been around 15 years or 10 years working relentlessly on this purpose. But it's, it's, it's purpose that begets drive and drive begets success. Yeah, which incorporates mastery and, and enables you to be all resilient that, enough correct. and yeah, resourceful, uh, resourcefulness to keep, uh, you know, acquire all the resources and things that you need to achieve that mission. What about passion? Where does passion come into it? I know that's, that's not too far removed from purpose. A lot of people out there, they hear this stuff about passion and they, they hear about purpose, but how are they aligned and how do people go and find these things if they don't already, you know, know what their purpose on the world is? I, I would say purpose is the the beacon and passion is the fuel. So there is a difference. Purpose is what are we moving toward? You know, business owners that don't have purpose are running away. I, I can't handle these struggles. I don't want this problem. And we're running away from that problem. Purpose is we're getting pulled towards something and you move so much quicker when the magnetic force is pulling you in the same direction. So that's what purpose is. But passion is the fuel. It's the day in day out fuel. If you have a great purpose, but you're not passionate about what you're doing, it becomes a real slog to stick it up, stick with it. I think the key is to find out what gives us joy in the activity. Not all entrepreneurs are cut out to manage people uh, and, to, and to choreograph resources and stuff like that. Some entrepreneurs create an amazing idea, but they really should stay as doers. They're really talented at something. Those entrepreneurs, if they're smart, are going to bring in someone that has the talent to do the management of people and so forth. But we have to make sure that we're in a field of passion that gives us excitement on a day-to-day -day basis. As an entrepreneur, find that for yourself, drive toward that purpose, and you got the one-two punch. Yeah, I love that. Well, what about business owners? When a lot of the work that you talk about 
uh, is about encouraging business owners to have a business that runs itself. And I think everyone would love that, you know, having that aspiring to that goal, even people who are perhaps are just too far down in the trenches for too long, that might seem almost impossible for those people. But where do they start, especially the ones who are really concerned about quality control and letting go of things that they believe they can do 100 times better than anyone else that they outsource it to? Yeah, it's called the I can syndrome. It's dangerous. I, I suffered from that from years. I says an entrepreneur, I can do this. I can do that. It's true. I can do it. I just do like a real shitty job at it. That's the part I didn't add in. So we can do lots of things, but can do and competence are two totally different things. So first of all, we have to acknowledge that by ourselves, that we're not superheroes. We may have super talents in certain areas, but we can't do everything. The next thing then is to get the muscle of delegation in place. Delegation is where we assign outcomes to people and then hold them accountable to those outcomes. And we have to start, I think, with the low hanging fruit, stuff that we are repeatedly doing and there's low risk of assigning someone else. If they really flub it up, um, how much damage is that going to do to your business? So, for example, invoicing. That is easy to sign out. And the risk, if they really flub it up, that's recoverable. That can be caught pretty easily. It's actually a low risk. If someone, instead of charging a dollar, charges $10 million by accident, the client will probably figure it out and, and bring you to the awareness there. It is recoverable. But there are certain things that are irrevocable. They mess something up and it kills a relationship. Those are the things that we have to get a little more sophisticated in our delegation before we start doing it. So start slow with delegation and then let it grow. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Well, in the last few years, we've, we've heard so much, Rich. a lot of it was from that Simon Sinek video that went, uh, that went viral, of course, his book too, talking about start with your why. But in your new book, Fix, Ex Fix, Fix This Next, you're talking about the power of what and understanding your what. So how do people discover what their what is in their business? Yeah, so that, that's why I explore and fix this next. I, I did this thing called, called the business hierarchy of needs. It's a translation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a human needs system. It's a business needs system. The great distinction is the Maslowian hierarchy of needs. We know what we need instinctually because we have inputs like eyesight, hearing, smell, touch. We get gut instincts. Our gut doesn't work so well in business. We need empirical data. We need the information from our business. So I created uh, five levels, just like Maslow, but within them, there's five needs at each level. Collectively, I call them the 25 core needs. And I found this to be consistent in businesses of any type, any industry. What we do is we go through a sequence and we make sure that the base level needs of our business are satisfied. And only when they're adequately satisfied can we elevate and serve higher level needs within our business. Just like human needs. We, you and I both need to breathe, eat food, drink water. If we're not breathing right now, this interview is done. Even though this is a, we're serving a higher level need right now, if the base is compromised, we go to it. Well, in business, the base is the generation of cash, which comes through sales. If you're not generating cash, your business is suffocating. We got to breathe. We revert to that. But once we have sales in and it's adequate, then the focus is uh, profitability, the retention of cash, because that brings about stability, longevity. You can see in this 2020 crisis, the pandemic, how many businesses were focusing on sales, but not profit. They're off the planet now. They're done. So profit's the next level of needs. Once that's satisfied adequately, we move to order. Order is creation of efficiency. No dependency on any individual, particularly the owner, like we were talking about. Then there's impact. It's creation of transformation. This is where businesses systemically don't do transactions, but transformation. And what I mean by systemic transformation, I mean, it's not one client saying, this was an amazing experience. That's when every client says, this was an amazing experience. And then the highest level need in a business is the formation of legacy or permanence. This is where a business is designed to live on beyond the owner. This is where business owners find out that they were really never business owners in the first place. We've been business stewards. We had a responsibility to bring this entity to life, but it's about the entity continuing on for generations to serve generations, regardless of the owner's input. You know, I, I'm really happy you brought up retention of cash there uh, because I, I actually read Profit First earlier in the year, which is another one of your, your amazing books. All of your books are, are fantastic and I would highly <laughs> encourage everyone uh, who's listening or watching this to go and grab a copy of all of them. But Profit First, I thought was great because it's a concept that I, I feel like is so rare around making, it also forces you to run lean on on the, the cash that you have at hand rather, oh, and you know, certainly having that set aside in the event that your business fails, you've got something to fall back on. Why? Is it that that profit first mentality is such a rare thing for businesses when they're starting out? I think because it's not logical. But the ironic thing is we don't need logic. We need behavior. So we humans, we, we feel that we're very logical, but we're behaviorally based. 
And traditional accounting tells us a very logical formula. Your sales minus the expenses you incur results in profit. So sales minus expense equals profit. But I saw this study that just opened my eyes to that formula not working. And it was conducted uh, by US Bank, SBA. They identified that 83% of businesses globally, small businesses, uh, that's a company that has $25 million in revenue or less. That's a lot of business. Uh, 83% of small businesses globally are surviving check by check in a constant panic, are not profitable. And there's 300 million of us. And I'm like, how can, whatever the calculation is, 250, 260 million people who start a business to achieve wealth, to be financially free, it's part of why we do what we do. How come we can't figure out the number one reason we started a business? That's when I looked at the formula. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's right there in the formula. It says profit comes last. And in fact, it's in our vernacular. We call it the bottom line or the year end. All these terms say last, and it's the behavior of people, humans. When something comes last, it means it's insignificant. So we're saying profit is insignificant. We delay the consideration, right? At the end of the year, do I have profit? No, damn it, maybe next year. And when something comes last, it gets delayed and delayed. So in profit first, found, uh, fundamentally, we flipped a formula. It's sales minus profit equals expenses. And in practice, what I'm saying is every time revenue comes into your firm, Take a predetermined percentage of that money, allocate it toward a profit account, hide the money away, and run your business off the remainder. It's the pay yourself first principle applied to business. Well, what about with early stage entrepreneurs who feel like they've got their purpose, but they're not comfortable charging uh, what they believe they're worth, or, or they're not comfortable around having that that conversation that gets them remunerated for the expertise that they have? What do you? What advice do you have for those people who struggle to charge for something that they're inherently good at, or something that they that they want to make a business out of? Yeah. So, so first of all, I get it. Secondly, I want to shake them and say, "Are you kidding me? You have to charge more." Because the number one argument you'll get not to increase prices is always from yourself. It's our own head. I'll lose my customers. Uh, what if no one likes me anymore? And here's the deal: if you raise your prices and you lose customers, it means all they cared was that you were the cheap guy. They want cheap, and who wants someone that wants you because you're cheap? So they're cheapening you. But I'll tell you something else, and this is the big secret: the vast majority of your clients, I guarantee want you to be profitable. Now, here's the deal. They don't say, hey, can you charge me more? And they won't say, could you rip me off a little bit? I really would like that. But what they will say is, I want your full attention. When I buy your product or service, I want you delivering the best of yourself. I want your undivided attention. I don't want you worrying about where you're making money and panicking because then you'll half-ass me. So care for me. And the only way you can care for a client, the only way you can give them focus is if you're not worrying about money. The only way you can do that is if you're sustainably profitable. And the only way you can do that is by increasing your prices. Your clients want you to increase your prices because they want your full undivided attention. Yeah, so true. It's interesting. A lot of the concepts you talk about really are flipping that script on the on the traditional way of thinking, isn't it? Oh, it really is. It, it's a lot of it's framing, right? It's the old... Um, if you think you're right or not, you're you're right. Or if you think you can or can't, you're right. I think for Henry Ford said that. You know, if you if I say I suck at math, I won't do the math practice and I'll suck at it. What if I said I like to find shortcuts in math? I will start repositioning myself. We, we the internal dialogue we have is very important on how we position our business. Yeah, so true. And you've you've stated previously the importance of being irresistibly magnetic in business as to what it takes to succeed. But what if you're in a fairly traditional job like an accountant or a lawyer or a financial advisor? What do those professionals do to, to be different and, and be irresistibly magnetic? We'll start by breaking the label. Like I, as you were saying, accountant, lawyer, oh my God, I started falling asleep myself. <laughs> you know, the, the thing is, if, if I said to you, hey, James, I'm a lawyer, the conversation's done. You know what a lawyer is. You know, the, you know I'm going to sue somebody. The question is, since all lawyers are the same from the customer's perception, it's like, are you cheaper? So if, if your label is the same as your competition, the consumer sees you the same, and then you enter the downward price pressure game, which is a dangerous game to be in. It's a race to the bottom. So the first step is break the label. Don't be an accountant, be a profit advisor. Now it's gotta speak to your skill set. You better know how to increase people's profit. Don't be a lawyer, be integrated counsel, someone that integrates into the culture to, to write better uh, legal documents. You have to break the label and it has to speak to your service differentiator. If you don't change the label, I don't care how different you are, clients aren't going to see it because the second you say you're a lawyer, they're going to say, I know what you do. Don't tell me anything else. Are you cheaper? Yeah, love it.
Well, we know that in businesses that, that no one ever really seems to care as much as the owner. What can business owners do to empower their team to care as much about the results and about the day to day as they do? So it's funny, I'm, I'm working on a book. I mean, this won't come out for five or six more years. So we're in deep uh, analytics right now doing this and running tests. I, I own multiple companies. We're testing our own companies, but we're testing other companies. Uh, here's the number one discovery we've had. No one cares about the business goals except for the owner. So I, in my own business, I came out, this is years back. Um, I was in the forensics industry doing computer crime investigation. And uh, it was very clear. I calculated if we did the right moves, we could have a $10 million a year. For me at that point, that have been the biggest business I ever had. Well, I came out, I called all my employees together and said, this is the year I had the drum roll going. We're going to do $10 million. Ta-da! And it was just, it was crickets. And I'm like, ta-da! Why aren't you guys excited? $10 million. And my trusted confidant, her name was Patty, came up to me and said, Mike, if we make $10 million, you get a new car, a new house, but why do we care? And that's when I had the realization that the number one concern for every single person is their own concerns. You know, Judy cares about being home on time uh, to be with her family for dinner. You know, Mark cares about saving money to buy his motorcycle. Uh, Dave wants to go back to his school. Jamel, you know, and it goes on and on and on. Everyone has their own concerns. So the job of a business owner is to understand the vision and desires that our colleagues have. Then organize the path of the business to satisfy their needs as we achieve the journey of our own personal goal. It's called goal alignment, individual goal alignment. In our own wall here, we have it, we call it the path to intentions. There's a whole wall in our building with everyone's individual dreams and their little micro dreams. Uh, leaving early on Friday so I can go to baseball games that my son's playing in, stuff like that. We have them pinned up and we say, are we achieving these individual dreams? Now, the company is not going to buy a house for someone, but it's going to free up the time for them to see a real estate agent. Um, it's going to bring the dream up over and over again and say, what are you doing to get there? Because people feel empowered when they achieve their own dreams. We just need to support them and recognize them. That's so the so the people who aren't even going out of their comfort zone to inquire as to what it is about their team's dreams, and they really can't, they have no one else to blame for their inferior results if they're, uh, if they're not getting there. No, no. But when we're like, why isn't everyone all fired up? You're making a salary. You know, a, a salary is, this, uh, is a means to a living, but it's about living is what we need to address. And the vast majority of businesses, including myself, for, for years ignored that. Now I'm in tune with that. I got a super little company. I have multiple, but this is the hub company where I'm broadcasting from. There's six people. And of the six people, three of us are full-time and the other three are part-time. Yet our numbers are consistent with a company of about 20 employees. And I'm getting consistently asked and curious about how can we be performing at such a level? Well, we are so attuned to what every individual wants. We also figured out another thing is match people's talents not to titles. We used to be very title oriented. If you're a reception, you got to answer the phones, do this, some light data entry. We now match talent to tasks. We have a web-like structure. Jenna, one of our colleagues, extraordinary at writing. She used to be our email manager. Well, she's not our email manager anymore. She writes the emails. We have someone else that's good at the number crunching and the, the, the data setup, but she's also doing uh, writing articles and blogs now, which is Jenna's passion. Jenna has elevated extraordinarily and represents us better than ever before. Her work output is three times what it was before because she's not in any area of frustration. She's doing what she loves. We tried to do it for every employee. The result is we don't have that pyramid structure of an organization. We have a web-like structure. You know, I had uh, Keith Ferrazzi on the show a few months ago, and he's been a huge influence on me, the author of books like Never Eat Alone. And Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I've seen him speak before. He's excellent. Yeah, he's great. His new book, Leading Without Authority, talks about that concept of co-elevation, where instead of your mission, you actually bring a lot of people into that to make it a shared mission. So that way, the way that they care about the company and its results is by you interlocking their desires and their dreams with their role at the company. Is that correct? That's exactly it. You know, I was looking at popular mechanics. Um, I get a little geeky. And uh, they were looking at these things called uh, Doric and Corinthian columns, columns that would support you know, heavy structures uh, made out of marble. And they plugged into a supercomputer and said, how do we make a column of the same material, but with uh, less density and retain the strength? And the system went through and it made, it's almost, God describes a web-like structure. It was I don't even, there was no symmetry to it. It seemed it was just this web-like structure. The column, I think, was one-third the material, but retained the exact strength. That's what we need to do in our business, these web-like structures. 
You mentioned before you've got a new book coming out uh, a little bit down the track. You've already got at least six books out that we know about that have been translated into more than 20 languages. And as we mentioned earlier, they're all seriously kick-ass books. As an author, I've got three books that are out now. What's, awesome. your, what's your process of being able to come up with a concept and figuring out whether there's actually demand for that particular solution that you're providing, as well as being able to get books published uh, at a fairly frequent basis? Yeah, well, I'm right. I'll do it in reverse order. I'm writing constantly. Uh, I, I wrote for three hours today already, um, but I write in parallel. So I'm right now. I'm I'm about to submit my manuscript. Actually, in two days for my most current book. I'm also working on a manuscript for my next book, uh, and I'm working on the outline for the book after it. So I do parallel processing. I think that's a big component. Um, most books take me about five years of the writing process. So I'm already working on the 2028, 2025 to 2028 books right now. Um, the, the, the testing is real simple. I, I reach out to my readership in the beginning. It was kind of tough because I didn't have a readership. Now I'm very blessed. Uh, I have a readership that's engaged and will respond and I say, Hey, where are you struggling now? And it's the feedback I use from them to pinpoint what subjects are important in the sequence. And then going back to the inception of books, I, I've been an entrepreneur my entire life and I've had some wonderful successes. Uh, I have some really, really big struggles. It was during the struggling periods I wrote down what I didn't understand by entrepreneurship. I wrote probably about a hundred different elements I didn't know. I've distilled it to 25 to 30 things that I think are important. And so I think ultimately I'll be producing 25 to 30 books as long as it's in alignment with people want. Um, and that's how I do it. Mike, you're brilliant at taking these seemingly complex uh, tasks and projects and, 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 you know, really making that something easy where people can essentially put one foot in front of the other. So thank you very much for everything here. Uh, systems are a big part of what you do. Now, I want to ignore the business side for a moment and focus on you personally and your role as a husband or your role as a father or even as a role in your own health. What systems do you have in place? Is there anything that comes to mind that helps you be effective in any of those roles? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I'm very process oriented. So I, I wake up at 530 every morning. Uh, I go through a meditative practice. I go, uh, I'll go to the gym. No, do I go to gym? Now? Oh no. I go to writing from six to seven. I'll do my right. I call it writing sprints. I do with other authors, 7 AM hit the gym seven till eight, uh, either cardio or weights, uh, eight to eight 30. I mean, I got down to actually 15 minutes. I'll, uh, eat. Then I'll take a shower, uh, hang out with my wife for a little bit and I'm off to work. I'm walking into my office at nine o'clock. Uh, it's, it's very ritualized, right? So I'll prepare my cup of coffee. It, what I do is I put these elements of anticipation in. So I'm looking forward to the next moment because there's a little ritual there of the coffee or sitting down with my wife um, or doing um, working out. I work out regularly. I don't like to work out. I just don't miss it. So at the end, the ritual is a text to an accountability group saying workout done and, and a show of my Fitbit results. So I can't fake it. I look forward to those moments and therefore I push harder through the activity. And um, so that's served me in my personal life, my health and stuff like that. Um, and, and my wife is also a great guard of time. It, it's very easy for me to not stop working because I have such passion for it. So she'll say, all right, you, you said you're done by five. I expect you home at 515 and I have a bottle of wine waiting for you. So um, <laughs> she's a down. great accountability <laughs> partner. And wine, wine doesn't hurt. <laughs> Sounds like so much of this stuff that you've got is around just having an awareness of what helps you perform at your peak and then being able to create the systems that help facilitate that. I think so. You know, I, think you I, yeah, I think I can go a little, for me, it works very well. I think it's a, a little bit manic for some people that I'm so process oriented, but, but it works for me. Um, I will tell you this, I, I've cooled down a little bit as the years have gone on and, and, and have been more present in more moments. And I appreciate that. Uh, my, my daughter, for example, um, she just, this is about two months ago. She said, Hey, I want to go cross country. My friend can't do it because of COVID situation. Do you want to go on a, you know, a 14 day trip with me cross country? And I got my schedule so booked up. My instinct is no, but my knowledge is like, if your if your daughter wants to spend a second with you, you better say yes and figure it out. So I said, yes, I'm in. I'm the third wheel guy. I'm in. And, and I had to change everything accordingly. It was the best move of my life, I think, to be with my daughter like that. So uh, I am a work in progress, but I'm, I'm learning the importance of presence. Yeah, you can't get that time back. Having a having a daughter like you no. and I were talking offline, it's amazing, isn't it? That any, you realize that's the most important thing is making sure that you're not just spend time with them, but having that presence and that quality time with them. That's exactly right. 
All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. Well, let's now move into the win the day rocket round where we ask you 10 questions for some fairly quick responses. Are you ready for this one, Mike? Oh, I thought that was the rocket round. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Number one, what quote inspires you the most? Uh, be yourself. Everyone, is, everyone else is already taken. That's by Oscar Wilde. Number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Uh, morning coffee, actually, but decaf, which is kind of doesn't count. <laughs> it's like the placebo effect. <laughs> what was that? Uh, the placebo effect. Of the, yeah, the placebo, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. <laughs> Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? Um, uh, just follow your heart, not the system, for sure. Number four. And, and by the way, and, and that means it's okay to fail. Like, follow your heart and learn from that as opposed to following what people expect of you. Number four, what book do you gift the most? I gift the most. Well, I gift my own because I have a plethora of them. My uh, favorite book right now is probably... Um, me, I guess I guess it's influenced by Robert Saldini. I'm, oh. Right now, I'm actively sharing that all time classic, one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely yeah. brilliant book. Uh, but but the one, but about a month ago, I read Rejection Proof, and I was like, handing that one out. That's amazing too. That's by his name is Jia Zhang, a, a guy who went out intentionally to get rejected over and over again for a hundred days. Interesting story. Yeah, brilliant concept. I'll have to check that one out. Yeah. Uh, number five. Was there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Yeah, my my goofiness and stuff. Like I, I thought, yeah, I had to have the slick back hair, be you know, super professional. I, I'm admittedly goofy, and it it, it turns some people off. Some people are like, oh my god, this is just like a normal guy. He's a little bit mental, but he's a normal guy. So I I let that out, and um, that has served me extraordinarily well. It, it distinguishes me, I think, from just generic pontificator. There's a quote I think about often. It says, to the right people, you can do no wrong, and to the wrong people, you can do no right. And it oh, like, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, uh, number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? Um, do it quickly. Uh, do it frequently um, and, and learn from it, but don't try to avoid it. Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? You know, first thing that comes to mind is probably a homeless person. I, I don't know if I really understand, I don't understand the journey and the struggles, and therefore I'm very prejudiced. I, I come to a judgment. Um, I, I think it's, it's if I'm at a, a bench, uh, if that's the next person that walks by, I'd love to learn their story. I, I think I have a lot to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Me too. Uh, number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or business? A calendar. I mean, it's so stupid, but so simple. I was trying all the fancy task managers and calendar. If it's in the calendar and there's a time slotted for it, that's the best task manager. I love it. And number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. Uh, to be on Saturday Night Live. That is a long shot because uh, I'm neither a celebrity nor a comedian, um, but that's a dream because I think I think I could hang. I think I could hang. I think you with your network and your your track record, we could make that happen. Maybe <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That, that's my big, big, big dream to share a stage with with some of the greatest comedians I think of all time. Awesome. And last question: What's one thing you do to win the day? Uh, it, it, it's it's so obvious. It's exercise and health. Like there's a big difference. Like you know, as the day long goes on, my energy is building and people are like, how do you have so much energy? I'm like, I really work at maintaining energy. And my output at the end of the day often feels just as strong, if not stronger than it was throughout the rest of the day. And I attribute that to religious exercise and, and rest and recovery, you know, exercise and recovery. Yeah, absolutely love it. Well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Mike and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Mike McCallowitz. Check out his website, mikemccallowitz.com. Grab, uh, grab a copy of his new book, Fix This Next on Amazon, not to mention his other awesome books like The Pumpkin Plan, Profit First and all these other books. Uh, seriously, they are all amazing. I love every single one of them. Again, we'll link to all that and more in the show notes. Mike, thanks so much for being on the show. James, thank you, brother. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Mike Michalowicz. He's an incredible leader of transformation for entrepreneurs and professionals, but I think there are so many lessons we can take from him to help in other areas of our life too, whether it's our romantic relationships, parenting, and even the relationship we have with ourselves. 
That's all for this episode. If you're enjoying the show, hit the subscribe button. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends to subscribe too. Win the Day with James Whitaker is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also leave a comment to let us know your favorite takeaway from this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.